It's game day and diehard fans have overtaken LSU's campus. As the game time draws near, thousands of fans begin to line North Stadium Drive, awaiting the team and listening for the cadence of drums announcing the fans' impending arrival. The excitement builds at Victory Hill. The band stops and begins to play the opening of the pregame salute. As they transition to touchdown for LSU, they run in tempo through the street and down the hill amidst the crowd of cheering fans. It's the kickoff to another memorable night in Tiger Stadium. We are all about trying to uh, get them pumped up for the game and, uh, and, 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 and trying to uh, get the fans to help, help us with that effort as well. We're kind of like the spirit of the, you know, of the entire stadium, so you know, what we do kind of affects how much the crowd gets into the game. LSU Tiger Band makes performances look effortless, both on and off the field. But the routines are actually the accumulation of months of hard work. It begins the preceding spring when high school seniors come in for auditions. The best performers are invited back to band camp the week before the start of the fall semester. It's from like 9 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night, so it's really tolling on you. And I think by the end of the week, you're just emotionally drained. They are evaluated by our entire staff on marching and playing. Uh, and then near the end of our band camp week, we make our final decision as to who is going to be in the 325-piece Tiger Band. The fall semester begins the week after the band members are in place. Rehearsals start that same week. It's, it's putting it all together, knowing that you have to play the music well, knowing that you have to be in a certain place at a certain time, knowing that your step size has to be perfect. Um, staying with the group, making the entire thing look good and not just worrying about yourself. The Golden Girls, the Color Guard, and the Drumline all have their own practices aside from those with the rest of the band. Band directors use computers to lay out drills for the musicians. There are no shortcuts for the choreography of the Golden Girls and the Color Guard. The captains of each auxiliary are responsible for coming up with their routines. Well, we have to make sure that we have a full halftime show prepared to be learned by the girls and um, make sure that it's something that they can learn in the given amount of time we have, which is sometimes very short and sometimes not so short depending on the show. Oh, it's definitely exciting. It's a huge honor. At times it can be challenging because you want to show variety. And when you have fun music to choreograph to, it's, it's not bad. Most of the young ladies who become Golden Girls or members of the Color Guard have been preparing for these opportunities long before they get to LSU. I've been dancing since I was three years old. Performing is what I absolutely love to do. I was a freshman in high school when I first saw the LSU Color Guard perform and I knew from that minute when they did their pregame routine, that's what I wanted to do. And it was, they were flawless. Most band members have also acquired tremendous discipline. That skill becomes more entrenched when students have to combine college level classes with practices and performances. Sometimes when you have a bunch of schoolwork and then you have practices, but you know, being a part of this organization, you learn time management very well. We try to work them hard enough that they'll get it even if it takes them a little longer. After this rehearsal's over, you can't do any more. You just gotta sit back and watch it now. We, we hope that it'll be at the level that we expect it to be. Nothing can really prepare band members for the flood of emotions on their first game day. I don't think it was fear, but there was definitely a ton of excitement and nerves. Obviously my first year um, on the team, my first time performing in Tiger Stadium, is something I will never forget. Band members soon discover their performances involve much more than just playing music. They become key boosters for both the fans and team alike. We have a different song for first, second, and third downs. We also have to be able to know when the other team's on offense, when they're on a fourth down or like a turnover, and then when there's TV timeouts. 
were in charge of playing during those times. It's a huge mental game, the entire football game. The football players enjoy what our song selections as well. Uh, we see them uh, interact with the uh, with the tunes that we play. We see the coaches getting excited about with the tunes that we play and and uh, getting involved just like the fans get involved. It just adds to the total excitement of what happens in Tiger Stadium. Successful football seasons usually result in prolonged band seasons when students get to perform during bowl games. It's also an opportunity for the band to perform in front of larger television audiences. One of the biggest goals for the LSU football team is to play in the Sugar Bowl, an experience LSU has enjoyed several times in recent history. As with all road trips, band leaders handle the travel plans and help with other expenses. It isn't always easy for hotels to accommodate the 325 member band. Once they arrived at their hotel, only 10 at a time could take the elevator to their rooms. One more. Come on. Come on. Many chose to take the stairs rather than endure the wait for a ride. Within a couple of hours, band members were taken to a high school football stadium to begin three and a half days of practice. Within a matter of minutes, it all started coming together. On the morning of the Sugar Bowl, the band got one last chance to practice, this time in the Superdome. And there were still some last minute kinks to work out. Anthem, and at that time, you need to just stand very solemn. Okay? At attention. Remember how we measured you off yesterday? We didn't hit that as well today. That spacing was not as good as it should have been. By game time, it was obvious all of the practice had paid off. While halftime is when all eyes and ears are on the band, the group's rally cry to football fans and the team were evident throughout LSU's Sugar Bowl win, a win the band helped to inspire. Each time there's a specific down that comes up, the band has a routine that they go into, and the, uh, the players know that, and, and, and they hear it, it energizes them clearly. Uh, they love being rewarded when they make a great stop with the, with the music, when they make a great play, when they make a first down. <laughs> While the Tiger Band has enjoyed tremendous success in recent decades, it came from very humble beginnings. There were only 11 members of the band when it started out in 1893, the same year the university played its first football game. They probably didn't have much training. They all got together to play, and it really just fell apart at their first performance because uh, they, apparently they hadn't rehearsed enough and they didn't feel secure enough and when they all started playing at one time it went in all different directions and they just had to stop their performance. The university was still in the early years of rebuilding both its physical facilities and its student body. Fire destroyed the old LSU campus near Alexandria that William Tecumseh Sherman opened in 1860 before going off to become a Union general during the Civil War. After the fire, students were housed in the Deaf and Blind School in Baton Rouge. 
A short time later, they moved to the Pentagon Barracks site near the state capitol. The move thrust the university into a lot of debt. The university's budget got even tighter in 1873 when Governor William Pitt Kellogg cut off funding to LSU because the university failed to comply with federal guidelines for admitting black students. Consequently, the population at LSU dropped from almost 200 students before the Civil War to only about a dozen. To help overcome money problems, LSU President David F. Boyd pressed for a merger between his school and the University of Louisiana in New Orleans. Boyd got his wish and the student population immediately increased to more than 180 students. As LSU grew, so did interest in a band. In 1893, the students formed the organization. The director, Ruffin Pleasant, a young student who would go on to become a governor of Louisiana. He was very organized, a very disciplined, type of individuals that when he called the band together, he wanted them there on time. They would practice very strenuously. He wanted them to be able to perform. So apparently he was a, a born leader, well organized, and very intelligent. Pleasant's band gradually got more comfortable with performing. The next issues were money and instruments. They would get on the corners of Third Street and, and perform and they would advertise to eat at Ollie's or, or shop at, at uh, Godshaw's or, or visit this place as advertisements. They would make money not only for wearing advertisements on their front and their back, but they would also pick up nickels and pennies and quarters and dimes and dollars from, from interested fans, from interested citizens. Pleasant graduated in 1896, leaving the band in the hands of Professor W.B. Clark. The organization made great strides during Clark's reign, performing during the New Orleans Mardi Gras parades, during halftime shows when LSU played against Tulane in New Orleans, and at the State Fair in Shreveport. Mr. Clark, at the beginning of the century, he was blind. I don't know. I mean, it was unbelievable what he did with the band at the time he was here. He was here on two different tenures. He was here early, and then he came back as band director later on. He had to be a really interesting person. Clark marched and played with the band despite his blindness. By then, several dozen students were in the band, and it was quite proficient. It had established a sophisticated military look in its new uniforms. After all, LSU was a military school. It was a very drab gray with a purple stripe. With the move to the present site and an enrollment that had jumped to just under 2,000, it was becoming obvious that LSU was destined to become a great university but the quality of the band improved at a gradual pace until the election of Huey Long as governor of Louisiana in 1928. The flamboyant governor worked hard to improve the state, building roads and bridges, including the Mississippi River Bridge in Baton Rouge. He also began construction on the new state capitol. But the governor also liked to play, and one of the things he enjoyed playing with most was the LSU band. Long decided he would turn the band into a showpiece for the state, his first order of business, hire a new band director. He found one at one of his favorite hangouts in New Orleans, the Roosevelt Hotel. Huey Long really enjoyed the musical performances of Castro Carrazzo. So one evening, he was there, he sent his bodyguard to the stage and asked Mr. Carrazzo to join him at his table. Uh, Professor Carrazzo, as he was called, came to the table. Huey Long told him, and I quote directly from Castro Carrazzo, you are now the band director at LSU. Come with me, we're returning to Baton Rouge. The men returned to Baton Rouge, and the governor reportedly ordered Carrazzo to call LSU President James Monroe Smith at three o'clock that morning. That's right, three o'clock that morning, to tell him to fire Alfred A. Wickbolt the next day. Carrazzo made the call. Of course, Long believed Carrazzo could improve the sound of the band, but that wasn't enough. He wanted to have the largest band in the country in numbers. So he had someone to do a survey, and they found out that some band, I think it was in the Big Ten Conference, had a band of 225. Long wasn't satisfied until he had more than 225 members in LSU's band. It didn't seem to matter how well the band members could play their instruments. They would give the big guys 
the big horns. That would be the sousaphones and the baritone. They would give the little guys the oboes and the flutes and the clarinet, and they would merely march around holding the instruments. They couldn't play a note, but uh, it, was, it was the big show and not at that time the sound. Once he had the band in place, Long wanted it well equipped. He would have a session of the legislature and say, we need new band uniforms at LSU. We need new instruments for, for LSU. If you don't provide them, we'll raise your taxes. Not only did Long want uniforms, he dictated exactly what kind of uniforms he wanted. Huey Long wanted to make it a very showy band, and the colors were purple and gold. So he asked the band director to go out and let's, let's find get some purple and gold and put some show and put some brightness in this and pep it up. Long didn't stop there. He co-wrote music for the band with Carrazzo, sometimes waking Carrazzo up at two or three in the morning. I wrote the two songs with Huey Long. One is Touchdown for LSU and Darling of LSU and I also wrote the, the fight song. Mr. Carrazzo told me that. And he would say, get your pen and paper, write this down, I've got this new song. And he whistled on the telephone, Touchdown for LSU, which the band uses as the opening of every football game at LSU. He whistled the darling of LSU, when we used to have LSU darling. Long also helped write the LSU Cadets March. He never did any correcting in his, on his paper, no changes, nothing. Once the governor had the band director, the band members, the uniforms, and the music, they were ready to hit the road. Huey would be out in front of the band on the right side, to, uh, greeting people and just enjoying himself tremendously. Sometimes he'd run interference for us or uh, shout instructions to the policemen to get the crowds out of the way and that kind of stuff. Long also looked out for band members individually when they traveled. Lou Williams remembers an occasion when the band spent the night at the Roosevelt Hotel in New Orleans while waiting to perform at a game between Tulane and LSU. I think I mentioned something about some of the boys wanting to have lunch or something and uh, he said, by the way, Seymour, go downstairs and get me 500 $1 bills and uh, get somebody to pass them out to the band boys and the cheerleaders and uh, anybody else that looks hungry. <laughs> we, he was so good to us as members of the band that uh, uh, he was pretty much of a hero to, to the band members, and I'm sure, I'm sure to the football players. And Even after Long went to Washington as a U.S. Senator and Lou Williams graduated from LSU, Long still helped to manage the band. Lou recalls one telephone call from Long when the band was preparing to go up to Nashville for a game against Vanderbilt. He said, How long would it take you to get ready to, to go to Nashville with us? Uh, I want to divide the band into two bands and uh, let you lead one of them and the, the other drum major and lead the other one. Within hours, Lou, the senator, and the band were on a train headed for Nashville. Long would maintain his close ties to the LSU band up until he was assassinated in 1935. By then, the LSU band had all of the physical materials needed to succeed, but a political cloud reportedly hung over Professor Carrasso's head. He said uh, the night that Huey P. Long, or the evening, was, was shot, he said he received a call the next morning from the university and was informed that he was no longer the band director. As it turned out, Carrazzo would remain at the university for another five years. He would even build a new band hall and incorporate twirlers and the drum majorettes in the performances. He would also direct his band during a performance in the Sugar Bowl. However, Carrazzo was never comfortable again as LSU's band director, telling people politics cost him his job. It was purely, in my opinion, that Castro Carrazzo was hired by Huey Long. He was pretty much controlled by Huey Long. He was funded by Huey Long. That when Huey Long went, they disassociated anybody that was connected in with Huey Long. Carrazzo was replaced by Arthur M. Culpepper, 
who tried to maintain the same size band that Carrazzo had, but it was not to be. Many of the young men who would have ended up in the band were instead called to duty into World War II. The band then was only comprised probably of about 50 or so uh, members. That's when females were invited to join the band. While fewer students were in the band for various reasons, the organization continued to improve. When you got into early stages of World War II in the 40s, high school band music was beginning to improve. Uh, people were being properly trained, graduating from schools with degrees in, in music, music education. And, and so yes, the quality improved uh, when, you, when you added, not, not just because you added females, but because they'd had better training than the ones in the 30s did, than the guys did. And so from there on, they kept girls in the band. And both women and men continued their interest in the band. It opened the door to more bands at LSU. So now you had the premier band would be the concert band. The second level would be the varsity band. And then the general band would be the, the, the military band. They would audition students from the military band for the concert band. The students who won out in the auditions then performed in the concert band. The university put more emphasis on the leadership of the band. L. Bruce Jones took over in 1946, adding a tone of professionalism to the organization. He ruled it with an iron hand, but he was an extraordinary mind, and he was a wonderful musician. Uh, when uh, L. Bruce Jones came as a uh, director from Little Rock, uh, he made me the band captain for a year in the concert band. So uh, L. Bruce Jones was, was fantastic. Uh, he was a great conductor and a musician. Jones Concert Band traveled throughout Louisiana and Mississippi giving performances. The marching band also stepped up its pageantry on the football field. And then the band department suffered a major setback. A fire practically leveled the band hall, destroying more than a hundred instruments and band uniforms that were less than a year old. That was a devastating loss as far as musical instruments, uh, music, uh, collections of uh, band paraphernalia that was never replaced. Within months, the band had new instruments and uniforms. However, the uniforms were not very appealing to some of its female band members. They were all designed for men, so the gals in the band really didn't have well-fitting uniforms. I remember having black shoes, spats, sh socks, track shorts, and the wool pants that were falling down, a belt, a t-shirt, a jacket, an overlay, a belt on top of that, a hat, and the plume. You also had to carry your rain jacket inside of your overlay, and there was one miserable thing called cross belts. I never got the cross belt thing right. The university rushed to build a new band hall. There were other new additions to the band as well. A new band director, Tom Tyra, who preserved the legacy of his mentor, L. Bruce Jones, for five years. Then, in 1964, William Bill Swore took over the position. Swore was here at the time when the Tiger Marching Band won the only college marching band contest that was ever held. And it catapulted the, the LSU marching band into national visibility instantly. He developed that famous pregame, the one that everyone tries to sing and sing that goes bum, bum, ba, da. Well, in August of 1964, he sat at his desk and composed that opening pregame show, which is used in every pregame of every LSU home football game. Frank Wicks was named band director in 1980. One of his first moves was to create an indoor band concert called Tiger Rama. The performance sells out every year in November. <music> Alumni band performances also emerged annually under Wicks. Former band members have their one day to enjoy the lights and the fans in Tiger Stadium once again. Once you're not able to walk out on that field anymore, it's a huge disappointment. You, know, you, you really want to still go back and do it. So, of course, you're going to go to practice and march on the field again. 
Absolutely. That's a thrill like no other. There's certain routines we have kept since about 1975 for our Hay Fighting Tigers and Fight for LSU and pregame salute that are standard and that have, will never change. 2010 brought several major changes to the Tiger Band. Construction began on a $10 million band hall that band members had been wanting for decades. It provides enough space for all 325 students to perform at the same time. Frank Wicks ended his 30-year tenure with the band. Veteran assistant Roy King then stepped in, being named director of the marching band. The legacy of the Tiger Band, which is, which is well entrenched, I think that will live on. Um, and the standard of excellence that, uh, that the fans have come to know and expect will also live on. Another successful season comes to a close, as it has for generations of band members before them. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.